Okay. Um, oh, there's a microphone. Um, good to go? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming in today. Um, my name is Mo Jabbari. I am part of the infrastructure line of business at ARM. I lead mostly our initiatives in VRAN and Open RAN, so mostly telco uh, background and uh, all that. So um, today's discussion is uh, something we have started recently with the help of our friends in WindRiver and Starling X community, and that's um, looking at how VRAN can run efficiently on ARM these containerized and uh, virtualized solutions on the ARM ecosystem. Um, so, a bit of background. Well, this is the motto of ARM. We truly believe that the future is being built on ARM. Um, even the present is being built on ARM. If you look at the numbers, there are around 250 billion um, chips based on ARM. That's 30, 40 chip per person in this world. Just last year, there was 30 billion chip um, based on ARM manufactured. There are 650 plus companies that are using ARM chips in their designs. So it's already everywhere. And uh, in your water, in your uh, scotch, everywhere. And we believe that um, um, estimates are that around 70% of the world are somehow using something that has ARM. The other 30% usually they are still babies, so they can't use. Um, this shows the footprint. Of course, till now, mostly ARM was known for being uh, ubiquitous in cell phones, sensors, and etc. But that's not the case anymore. Um, in cases you know, like telco, ARM has been there for years. In the traditional vendors of the telco, these are Ericsson's, Nokia's, Huawei's of the world, ARM already has a strong footprint, around 80% of the solutions out there, the classic RAN or whatever you call them, traditional RAN, was already based on ARM. Um, but 5G is bringing its own challenges. So right now there is almost 1 billion connections based on 5G, but it's expected that it's growing to 5 billion because a lot of countries are just deploying. India just started, for example, compared to East Asia that, um, for example, South Korea has, I think, 80% of the subscriber moved to 5G, but in US and other places, there's still a long way to go. Beside that, uh, 5G is much more energy hungry. This is not technology being inefficient, it's just there's more bandwidth, there is more data to be pushed through. So each tower becomes uh, more powerful, and that means more energy hungry. And energy is becoming more and more an important one, not just because uh, Russia decided to attack Ukraine. Um, every day it's becoming more and more expensive to create, uh, to generate energy. And uh, almost 40% of OPEX of operators are already going to energy costs. That's why um, there was a recent uh, poll by GSMA, that's the Association of Operators, that um, almost 70, 80% of the operators' top concern was energy consumption. Uh, so what is driving the next generation of wireless infrastructure? One of them is the compute efficiency, because the, one of the most power-hungry sections of this whole equipment of the 5G is the silicon, the um, silicon's power consumption. And so silicon compute efficiency is quite important for the industry. This goes for digital parts, like CPUs, and even analog parts, which is the radio side. Uh, that's an, a separate nightmare. Almost 80% of a cell site is uh, power is consumed by the radios. They are very inefficient, inefficient something around 20, 30% efficiency, sometimes even 10. There is uh, ecosystem support. This is the open RAN movement. Um, uh, operators want more and more partners in this industry. And finally, cloudification. The idea of VRAN, uh, which was suggested years ago, um, is, has found uh, true champions. Um, if you talk to leading operators, it's mostly European, they believe 6G will be just VRAN. There is no DSPs in that. Everything should be uh, fully 
cloudified. And uh, where does this leave ARM? ARM, four or five years ago, started a line which is called ARM Neoverse. This is um, a modified version of ARM technology that can scale to many cores, and each core will be much more powerful. So this line is uh, targeting not only cell beyond the cell phones, goes to infrastructure. So cloud providers, similar to like AWS's and Azure's and etc. Um, and they have built chips based on this, if you have heard of Graviton 2. There is HPC's Fugaku, which until recently was the number one supercomputer in the world, what is based on ARM Neoverse. The 5G and carrier infrastructure, which we are talking here, and of course, Edge. There has been a long pass um, here um, in, for the ARM Neoverse. There was a lot of announcement initially for the chips. There was operators standing behind ARM technology like DISH that said eventually they want to move, run everything on the AWS Graviton 2s based on ARM. Um, Dell built accelerator cards based on ARM. Qualcomm pa uh, partnered with HP. HP built chips based on ARM silicons. And recently, operators have started making announcements. Uh, I'll come to NTT Docoma and SoftBank announcements. And recently, we have joined uh, Open Infra Foundation and Starling X. It's not final finalized, but I think it's in the PO stage, and I don't know, somebody put a logo over there, and etc. So we are almost there. And uh, which is thanks to initiatives from Wind River and Starling X community, we are really happy on this. I'll talk more about the partnership. Uh, I mentioned about the entity Docomo. Recently, well, they are the Japanese top dog <laughs> operator. And uh, recently they did something with NEC that provides their core network. They moved it to an AWS instance. And this is from their press release that they saw 72% power reduction just from moving to some legacy Intel solution to an um, AWS Graviton 2, which is Neoverse based. And this is something like 3.6 three times increase in efficiency. Um, again, SoftBank, another operator in Japan, a few days ago in Computex, they made an announcement with NVIDIA that they want to move um, their solutions to a centralized uh, um, 5G RAN. So the SoftBank's vision is to have mini databases across the nation, um, that these databases are both working for RAN and anything else that is running over there an edge, like, I don't know, metaverse, or metaverse time is past, generative AI, generative AI, or whatever is the buzz. And uh, we see more and more this, that if a, if a country can handle centralized RAN, centralized RAN really needs access network, fibers. So it happens easily in Japan and Korea, everything is fiber. US a bit harder because we don't have that much fiber. But if a country is, has a good fit for, is a good fit for centralized RAN, this kind of solution would be interesting because it opens the path to operators to really get, get that growth they always wanted. Like they always complain that, hey, we do all the work of infrastructure and then Uber comes and makes the money, not us. This helps them make database, data centers and host applications and create revenues for them. So what is the ARM advantage in the VRAN? Uh, we have done a lot of experiments with partners, um, modeling, simulations, actual running and measuring. And we see, depending on how you run it, what is the, something around two to four times you get um, improvement in power efficiency. That means something, your power drops like 50 to 75%. Depending on what you use, how optimized it is, and this is, um, bare metal or containerized, uh, doesn't change much. And this makes ARM and Starling X um, a match made in heaven because what we love about uh, Starling X, beside everything that operators love and they go and deploy it's, uh, Starling X or its commercial version, which is Wind River Studio, uh, besides reliability, latency, edge security, all this that are perfect, and not platform specific, it's the small footprint. Um, Starling X was written to be really low footprint because of possibly the heritage that it has. And uh, that makes it perfect because we have some low power consuming core here um, in the ARM Neoverse and that can host the Wind River, no, sorry, Starling X. 
um, perfect. Um, you have squeezed every bit of juice out of the system this way. Uh, these slides, I've stolen them from Bob deck, so <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> um, this is the general architecture of Starling S. Ifniana, where um, it, uh, the previous session was talking about how the open stack runs on that. So all this is the Starling X uh, orchestration, the services, et cetera, runs on the Linux, of course, the real-time uh, low latency or real-time Linux that runs on ARM, and that's the plan. And how it works in the data, um, in the CUDU story, so if you're familiar with the ORAN, VRAN architecture, they broke the base station site, the BBU, which was at the base station at the site. It was usually cabinets of embedded computing. And they made it a distributed unit and a centralized unit. The central unit is some sort of mini uh, centralized section that multiple sites connect over there. That will have its own, of course, cloudification. <coughs> and the cell site <coughs> is replaced by COT servers. At the moment, mostly x86, but it can, uh, what we are working towards is that ARM servers would be used. And uh, the whole workloads are orchestrated and are running on Starling X and uh, Windows Studio, usually a single in, in, in instance of that, so something a bit compact, because it's just managing one server or two servers. A bit more about the Neoverse um, and until I can connect these together, how it will run. So Neoverse is a family of three series, technically. On the left, you see the V series. These are the most performant chips. So they were designed with getting as much performance as possible without caring about um, how much power it consumes. E series is the opposite, and it is mostly focusing on reducing the power as much as possible. It's good for possibly Small cells, for example, that you care a lot about, about, about the power consumption or cost. V-series is good for um, hyperscalers. Of course, even V-series is more efficient than anything in x86, but they are hungry for performance. N-series, which is more fit for 5G, is a balance between both. Both a mix of power and efficiency. And uh, on each one of these, there has been chips that has been uh, are in the market, like... Um, N1, which was the first generation that came out, has the AWS Graviton 2 and Ampere Ultra. We will talk more about that. N2 is Marvel's Octeon 10 series. V1 is AWS Graviton 3, and the NVIDIA Grace, which recently made a lot of noise, is, and SoftBank wants to use that, is a V2 series. And of course, the rest of them are coming. The, in the E series, you see HQ, that's a California startup that they are targeting small cell um, deployments. So the chips that we have for um, servers, um, the COT servers, of course there is AWS. AWS has a, something called Outpost that it's a server uh, that you put on cell site or in your factory for edge. It's managed by AWS, but it's uh, something local if that's what you like. Ampere is a California startup that has made a lot of chips based on ARM. There is Ampere Ultra, Ultra Max, and there is another one coming called uh, Ampere One. Marvel has a set of chips, Octeon 10 Fusion and Octeon 10, and eventually the NVIDIA Grace CPU or Grace Super Chip, which is 144 core. These are the chips that um, servers can be built. Um, Ampere has a lot of servers based on this. There's a set of ODMs that have built one. AWS builds its own service, uh, servers. NVIDIA servers are coming. Um, they were showcased in Computex. Marvel is a bit more complicated. If somebody was interested, I can explain that. Um, the ARM ecosystem, so a few years ago when we started this, of course, we had a gap of 10 years to close with our friends on the, in, in the Intel. So we started from private network companies onboarding small um, players to show, hey, this is feasible, and we started growing from there. Um, now we are have, we have an ecosystem of carrier grade solutions. These uh, include server manufacturers like HP and Supermicro, um, containerization solutions like upcoming Wind River Studio <laughs> based on the Starlink export that is happening. We have la RAN layer one vendors, players like Nokia, Fujitsu, and NEC as RAN vendors on the open RAN side. 
and uh, it grows by day. Um, it is becoming something that uh, um, two years ago when we talked to people, everyone says, okay, pay me 10 million to do a port to R. And now it happens without even us knowing sometimes we see the announcement. Um, the main reason is that there has been a lot of education in the market uh, that with an x86 solution, getting to the CapEx, OpEx targets that operators have in mind is really hard. No matter how much you discount the CapEx, OpEx is always there. And uh, ARM is seen as something that gets closer and open RAN or VRAN to a traditional RAN solution in terms of if you, um, power efficiency, cost, and etc. So this is the POC that we are working with the team. Um, technically, we are using CUT servers. These are either Supermicro or HPE. And uh, based on Ampere chipsets, these Ampere chipsets, usually we are using 80 core here. They can boost be 64 or even less. One beauty of Ampere is that if you don't use the cores, each core consumes something like 61 milliwatt, almost nothing. So you don't have to use the whole thing um, to get to really low workloads. Of course, the CapEx part is always there. It's um, so the idea is that we will run. We have partners. I haven't put them here. We can talk ab ab about that a bit more unofficially. But they, are port they have ported their CUDU, and now um, they are trying to integrate this with the Starlingus on ARM and uh, get to a POC that can be shown to operators. Of course, there is productization stage of that, which has its own story. When it comes to running Starling X on ARM, so um, of course the overall idea is to run everything on ARM64. For this, we have to create build systems, move this LAT tool to ARM, uh, make the ISO images over there. There are a lot of package work. Um, we have to port source code of a lot of maybe more than 80. Something like 1,400 packages needs to be rebuilt, so they don't have to be ported, but this is also work. And so on, container image rebuilt and feature adjustments. And uh, more than that, uh, we have to support the community via with providing servers and packages on mirrors, etc. And of course, there's various ways that Starling X is deployed. Right now, all in one simplex is the first target because that's most common in the DU deployments, but of course, there is, uh, it won't stop there because although Starling X is uh, really good for telco, we know that it has much more use cases in edge and et cetera. So we are not limiting to what telco needs. Uh, we will go the whole game. Um, so what we have done so far, it is a POC. We have uh, created a native build system. We have rebuilt some. We have ported some uh, packages at POC level, means that there are some workarounds and hacks that are over there just to get to this. Um, in Mobile World Congress, we did a demo at Armboost, uh, thanks to the everybody that helped over there. And uh, we don't have a video of that, but these are some slides out of that. You see the Starling X here is running on an Ampere instance. And uh, it has its own part. You see, this is the node that are on ARM64 and many, many pods over there. And if somebody was interested, we can also go into a more detailed demo. Not here, but somewhere else. Bob, I need Bobak's help on that. Um, there is a roadmap ahead of ahead um, to, well, as mentioned, the packages of are ported in POC level. We are working on uh, making them at product level. Some servers are going to be sh uh, sent to the community, so it becomes part of the CI/CD of the future generations, and the rest of the items you see here. Um, the work has been done till now in the partnership between ARM Engineering and uh, Wind River Engineering and some Starling X community. Um, we are quite grateful for that. We are going to do more and more the heavy lifting. Um, because of two costs, took the, took the team a little bit time to get familiar with the code base, etc. So it is a joint effort that is ongoing. Um, I have two slides that are not starting X. I'm sorry, but <laughs> since ARM team is also involved in the Kata containers, they asked me to uh, also mention this. Um, so if you're not, 
Kata Kainerans, of course, in another project with the Open Infra um, Foundation. It is something that uh, gives the performance of containers, but security of um, virtual machines. It's heavily supported in China um, and finance. By do these guys deploy Kata Containers significantly? So what ARM has done is that we have made sure ARM is a class one citizen in this project. A lot has been done and uh, we are just making sure whatever next version of the Kata comes, Kata 3.0 is coming soon, is fully uh, supported on ARM 2. So this is an example that this was the same team that was working on Kata containers now is owning the Starlink export. So same way that they moved from scratch to moving Kata ARM as a class one citizen in Starlink, uh, in the Kata, the Starlink X pass is the same story. And that's a lot of thank yous. Yes, if, thank you. Don't know if there is any questions. Yes, there is a question. Um, this is compared to Ice Lake, Xeon Ice Lake. Usually a 32-core two core version of that is used in telco deployments. And uh, so if you look at, we have a measure called megabit per second per watt. So how, my, how much data you are transmitting over the air to your users, actual throughput, per wattage that the server consumes. Based on that wattage, ARM is sometimes two to, to four times uh, more efficient. The whole so baseband, so the DU section. So that's layer one, layer two on the server with the NICs, accelerators, everything. Sapphire Rapid, which is their new generation, closes the gap a little bit, but not that much. Um, if you were interested, we can go into depths of that discussion. Just in terms of the performance, mm -hmm. do you know what frequency rates and what minor levels can be passed? Um, depends. For example, the model that mostly we use is 4 by 400 megahertz. Um, the frequency doesn't change for the DU because it's an RU problem mostly. Um, and, uh, but even if you model the massive MIMO, usually the gain stays the same because it's the pure pr process. The number of the cells change when you change the layers or the throughput or the bandwidth. But the relative number usually stays the same no matter if you're using a 20 megahertz 2 by 2 or a massive MIMO 100 megahertz. Yes, yes, definitely. Technically, we try to be, um, uh, we have contracted Radesses, if you know, there's a, this is a layer two, three vendor, to run the same workload, work stack on ARM versus 686 to show exactly, it all staying the same, what would be the gain. It's not that different. I mean, if you look, uh, silicon, comp silicon has a measure called spikint, if you have heard. It's like a general test of performance. And uh, it mimics more various loads that a CPU can run from data center, database reading, memory reading, file access, computing, I don't know, mathematics, etc. Even if you compare the spikint of an ARM server versus x86, you get to the same numbers. So what we learned after two years of testing is that VRAN loads are not that different from a CPU's view point of view in terms of efficiency. Um, so same numbers usually map that, for example, if you look at the ma material that AWS, for example, publishes about efficiency of their ARM instances, same numbers usually match over there too, different depending on the load. One part that is quite different is if you want to do a look aside layer one. So look aside layer one is a layer one that runs on the CPU um, instead of some accelerator. And on that, there is some differences in technology of these two. So, but still, because of the sheer efficiency of ARM, that result also very close, is very close. Yes, yes. AVX is a technology that Intel has that goes for 512 vectors. ARM's technology, which is called Neon or SV, goes to 128 or 256 bits. So it, you, ha you have smaller vectors. But the difference is that on an Intel server, sometimes you have 32 instances of AVX. But on ARM, this Ampere one, you have 18 instances of 128. 
So it's big. Sorry? 8 0. 80 cores. 80. So 80 cores that each one of them so, um, processes 128 bit eventually triumphs 32 core, cores that support 512. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much again. For, oh. Thank you. Thank you very much again for your time. Feel free to come to me. <laughs>